fellowship with God is this thing called the altar. What happens now is that God creates a system with Adam, very simple system. It's so simple that the Bible doesn't even explain it. God continues to be in connection with Adam and Eve, but he's in connection to Adam and Eve through sacrifice. In other words, they have to look for him. They separated themselves from him. So in order for them to connect with him, they have to look for him. And what happens is that God creates a sacrifice system that says, if you want to find me, you need to sacrifice to me. So not, nothing much was talked about Adam and Eve sacrifice, but the place that was talked about was Cain and Abel sacrifice because Cain and Abel, they came and they sacrificed to God. It didn't talk about a physical altar, but usually when you have a sacrifice, there's an altar. So they present their gifts before God on the altar. And God looks at Cain's sacrifice and says, no good. And he looks at Abel's sacrifice and he says, wonderful. Abel gave the best of his meat offering and Cain gave what, what he had left. And God said, I don't want what you have left, so I'm not taking it. And Cain got angry. He got angry because what he presented at the altar, God didn't accept. The problem is that when Cain came to the altar, he was expecting to get affirmation from God. And the altar was never made for you to get affirmation. The altar was made for you to get forgiveness. The altar was made for you to have covenant. The altar was made for you to worship God and for you to affirm God. That's what the altar was made. So the, the, the badness or the insufficiency of his sacrifice was not just due to what he had, but it was due to his heart. When you come to the altar and you don't have the right heart, then whatever you put on the altar won't be right. So Cain develops the first principle of the altar, is that even though the altar is a place where you meet God, the altar is also a place where you can be rejected by God. And the danger in being rejected by God at the altar is that you have a desire for another altar because if God is rejecting me here I don't want this altar I want an altar where I'm accepted and God gives Cain a warning and he says to Cain that you should do right because if you don't do right there's another altar and it's called sin sin lies at the door but what happens now is that Cain makes a conscious thought that the altar of God is not getting me what I need. I got to build myself my own altar. He created a man-made altar. And the man-made altar was his anger, was his frustration, was his thoughts of low self-esteem. And he thought to himself that the best sacrifice to give in order for my altar to be appeased is to kill my brother. So he kills his brother, takes his life, and he thinks because he kills his brother that now he's free, but he's still accountable to the altar of God. It doesn't matter what altar anybody wants to make. It doesn't matter what altar anybody wants to develop or create. It doesn't matter what religion anybody wants to join. There's coming a day that the God ordained altar is going to have to be reconciled. Where just like Cain and Abel stood before God and they were judged, there's coming a day that everyone is going to be judged by the correct altar, but there's an evolution of the altar because this was a very simple altar. God was present. You gave a sacrifice. God responded immediately. You had communication with him and you knew what God thought about your sacrifice. Then time goes on and all kinds of things happen within the world. And God says that this world is lost. I'm going to destroy this world. But he saves a man named Noah and his family. And when they're on the ark, after they spend that time on the ark and God had saved them, they came off the ark. Noah came off the ark. One of the first things that he did is that he built God an altar. And he gave God burnt sacrifice at the altar. Noah gave God burnt sacrifice. And this is the first time the actual word altar actually appears. And the fact that Noah knew to, make, to do this as the first thing that he did when he came off of the ark is an indication that this was a common practice that he had throughout his life. Perhaps a common practice that they had throughout the world at that time. But he knew to build God an altar. There's nothing that was commanded about an altar, nothing that God said about an altar, but 
Noah had enough connection with God to understand that his life was meant for the purpose of building God an altar. He built God an altar for saving him. He built God an altar as a form of prayer and worship toward him. The Bible says that he built God an altar as a memorial so that he would never forget what God had done for him in terms of saving him and his family and saving humanity. And it's so wonderful that God's response to his altar was a rainbow as a promise that this will never happen again because altars save lives. So the Bible continues and talks about Abraham. Abraham built God an altar. The altar that Abraham built was the first time that God actually in the Bible indicates that he wants an altar to be erected. And he says, I want you to put something on the altar. What's that? Abraham, I want you to put your son, your only son, the son that you love on the altar. But wait a minute, altars are not for people. Altars are for animals. Altars are not for child sacrifice. Altars are for animals. Altars are not for pain and fear. Altars are for faith and for God to move and for God to work a miracle. And God says, no, Abraham, put your son, your only son, the son that you love on the altar and kill him. And when Abraham put him on the altar, Abraham raised up his hand ready to kill him. And then the voice shouted, Abraham, Abraham, because of your faith, I have, I have a ram in the thickets. Kill that. Your son is saved. See, the altar is a place where the things that you love that should die, there is a sacrifice that dies in the stead of you and the things that you love that provide forgiveness. And because that thing dies, it, it presents in you a joy unspeakable, full of glory that causes you to have a spirit of, of praise and a spirit of worship and a spirit of thanksgiving because the altar is a place where God transforms lives. And the Bible continues over and over and over again. Moses, Moses, uh, there's an evolution that takes place because Moses now, prior to Moses, people had altars in their home. Uh, people had altars, you know, in their business. People um, throughout history had altars. But when Moses comes now, God says that I want you to build me a tabernacle. And I want to move the altars from people's home into my tabernacle. And when I put my altar in the tabernacle, everybody's sacrifice no longer do you have individual sacrifices. No longer do you have sacrifices in your house and sacrifices over there and sacrifices over here. All the sacrifices will take place on one location, at one spot, at one time. It's going to happen in my tabernacle. He set up, he set up the altar in the tabernacle for the purpose of bringing the nation together and putting them under the rulership of one God. Where now they're under the rulership of one God, everybody sacrifices to the same God. Everybody sacrifices in the same way. Everybody sacrifices at the same level and everybody sacrifices for the same purpose. And the purpose was for forgiveness and reconcilia reconciliation toward God, but also it was so that they could begin to just um, burn a sweet incense to God. Prayer and worship so that they can begin to just be forgiven and then become people who are right in the sight of God so that they can worship and that they can be able to reach heaven with their praise. So it continues until we get into the time of David and Solomon. When you get into the time of David and Solomon, David has a heart to build God a permanent house where it's not moving anymore, not in a tent, but a permanent house. And by that time, Solomon now becomes king and Solomon puts inst and institutes what his father had put in place, which is the temple. And Solomon builds the entire temple. And when Solomon builds the temple, he builds not just one altar, but he builds two altars. The first altar that he builds is the brazen altar, which is in the outer court. And when he builds the brazen altar, that is the place that people put burnt sacrifices on. People kill the animals and they present them on the bronze altar for the purpose of them being forgiven of their sin. But then there is another altar that is in the inner chamber of, uh, of the temple and it's called the golden altar. And in the golden altar, that is where they burn incense. And the burning of incense is not about forgiveness, but the burning of incense is about worship. Where now the prayers that Israel prays, uh, they go up to God and God smells them. The worship that Israel worship, it goes up to God and God accepts them. It becomes a portal of transformation. You see, first they were forgiven, but after forgiveness, there needs to be a reinstitution, a, reinstitution, a, re, a reconciliation where now they come back into favor with God. And that's at the golden altar. 
at the golden altar, they come back into favor with God. So when you're looking at this whole thing as an altar, the altar is not just about reconciling man to God, but the altar is about opening a portal. That's probably the best word I can think about, opening a portal from heaven to earth, where now, where man is stuck in sin on earth and God is stuck in holiness in heaven. Somehow there's a portal that's open in the temple that allows man to be reconciled to the holy God and they become one. Where now man can be transformed and their life and their image and their concept and the way that they behave can be transformed through the power of the temple. That's why the temple is so important because the temple was that place on the earth where there was an altar that not only brought people back into relation with God, but it brought people back into favor with God. What Adam had lost had been restored at the altar in the temple. And we go into the New Testament. And so many things happened between Solomon's temple to the New Testament, but from Solomon's temple to the New Testament, there were all kinds of man-made altars. Jeroboam was the first one to build one of the major segments of man-made altars and he tried to pull people away from the temple, from the portal that connects them to God and he tried to create another portal, a portal that he had in Bethel and Gilgal. He tried to create another connection to another spirit. He said, I have another altar for you. He created that altar because he was fearful that if the people went back to Jerusalem and they worshiped there, they would leave him and they would join back to their old king Jeroboam. So he, out of fear, he created an altar. And as he created that altar, um, that altar began to grow and expand in evil. Because anytime you have fear and you have a thought process of recreating what God has already created, you would create an environment where the devil reigns and where the devil works. And through time in the northern kingdom which Jeroboam ruled, through time, you had people like Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab and Jezebel were so um, filled with evil from the altars that they had built and that they had um, funded that the evil that was in them, they did all kinds of wickedness. And God judged them for that. Because anytime you build an evil altar, the judgment of God will come. But the thing that God hated most about the evil altars that came from Jeroboam was that they were actually created to stop the people from going to the true temple where the true altar was, where the true portal to connect man to God was. They were actually a problem. So God allowed for them to be wiped out. But the problem then started happening in Jerusalem where now instead of being people being connected with God, they were just having false religion, just having whatever they want to do. No real connection to the temple and the temple was the place where God met them. So then Jesus shows up and when Jesus shows up, by then the temple has become a commercial organization. It's just become a business. And it's a business that has everything flowing, money flowing. It has prestige flowing. It has all kinds of things flowing. But the altar, even though the altar is receiving sacrifice, the altar is dead. The altar has become a man-made altar. God's temple, where he met people, has now become a man-made altar. But then Jesus shows up and Jesus says, um, he begins to turn over the tables and kicks over everything. And he says that this place is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you made it into a den of thieves. The reason why Jesus is mad is not just because of what they're selling. He's mad because this was a place where people were to meet God and God wasn't there anymore. The purpose of the altar is the altar is a place where people are supposed to meet God. And if they get there and God's not there, it ceases to be an altar. It might be, it might be something that has been put up, but whatever is there, God's not there. It's not a true altar. So Jesus had a desire to see a true altar. And what he did now in having the desire to see a true altar is that he would talk with people about the kingdom of God that's coming. There's coming a kingdom. There's coming an altar that is so big that doesn't matter where you're at, the altar can be accessed. In the Old Testament, in order for people to access the altar, they had to point themselves to where the altar was and to pray and to believe by faith that their prayer would go into the altar. But Jesus said there's a coming a kingdom that is so big in scope that no matter where you're standing, you can get access to the altar. Jesus was saying that I am not trying to change the system. I'm trying to expand the system. I'm trying to open up a portal that is so big that doesn't matter where you're at. If you're on the right frequency, you can connect to heaven and heaven can connect to you. So Jesus said, I'm going to show my secret to somebody. My disciples, I like these guys, but they're not ready for the secret. The scribes and the Pharisees, these guys are smart, but they don't really, really seem to understand the things of God. So I'm going to pick somebody 
who can understand the power of religion, can understand the power of the altar, can understand the power of forgiveness. And he finds a Samaritan woman, a Samaritan woman that's coming by the well, and he begins to reveal to her his plan. He said that I'm getting ready to switch up the altar. And she says, like, who are you? He says, I'm a Jew. He says that Jewish people and, 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 and Samaritans don't have anything to do with each other. He says, give me some water. She said that, you know, like, you want water for me? We're not supposed to be with each other. And through the conversation, they keep going until they start to talk about worship. And she says that, um, you know, we worship at this mountain and you worship, um, you know, um, where you worship because, you know, you have your faith. And he says that there's coming a time where there's not going to be an altar in Jerusalem anymore. There's not going to be an altar in Mount Gerizim anymore. But there's coming a time when God's going to move them the altar. And he says that you're no longer going to pray in places, but you're going to pray by spirit and you're going to pray by truth. There's coming a time where the spiritual altar that I've always had, I'm moving it from a physical location and I'm moving it into a spiritual location because God is looking for worshipers. He's looking for people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. He's moving his altar from physical places to spiritual places and he's getting ready to switch things up. So now by the time you get to Paul, Paul recognizes where the altar is. And Paul says that you guys don't know this God, but there's coming a time that you will know this God because I will preach the gospel to you. Because the altar has switched locations. It's not in the temple anymore. The altar is not in the church, but the altar is in you. And the reason why Paul says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, is because the fire that's on the altar always represented God. God is the fire that's on the altar. But there is a sacrifice that's on the altar and it represents the flesh of me and the flesh of you. And that flesh is on the altar and the fire is God. But God says that the way that we present is that we present it with our mind. Our mind has become the new altar. Where God now says that I want your mind to be stayed on me because it is with your mind that you serve me. It is with your mind that you follow me and your mind has become the new altar. And when you present your body a living sacrifice with your mind and with your actions, I will transform you. You don't have to build an altar. You are an altar. And because you're an altar, it doesn't matter where you're standing, you can connect with me because you have become a portal from heaven to earth. And if you connect with me, I can transform you by the power of faith. It takes faith to pray to God. It takes faith to trust in God. It takes faith to receive the forgiveness of God. But God says, along with receiving forgiveness, I want you also to receive a spirit of worship and prayer. I want you to worship me and to pray to me in your body. And as you begin to pray to me and worship me, I will connect with you and I will use you to touch other lives I will use you to touch other people but you need the power of God on the inside of you so when you look at the shift there were altars all throughout the Old Testament and it evolved into altars in the temple because he wanted to bring you to one place he wanted to bring you to one Christ who's Jesus and when the Christ showed up at the temple he said that I am now going to expand my altar system from one location to anybody who is open to being an altar. And I've chosen you before the foundation of the world. And that's why he said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and everybody will prophesy because now everybody has access to the altar who wants to receive it. As many as believed in him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. You have the power on the inside, which is the altar of God. So I don't have to build myself an altar. I don't have to build myself a place, you know, where God shows up because I am the place where God shows up. Your temple is the body of the Holy Spirit. And God said that if you will allow your mind to believe it and you allow your faith to connect to it, I will transform you body, soul, and spirit. So a man-made altar is anything that a man creates to reach God. A God-made altar is anything that God creates to connect you to himself. And he said, I've chosen you and I am with you and, I, and my spirit is leading you. So we are connected to God. So I don't have to build myself an altar because an altar is already built and God built it. So my encouragement really is for us to get a transformed thought about it, that there's an evolution of the altar. The altar has moved from being something outside of us to becoming something within us. I get access to God, not by magic, 
Not because someone put their hand on me, but because God has chosen me. And it requires a faith to believe it. But once you begin to believe it, you understand that wherever I am, the altar is. Not that I in myself have power, but God's power works on the inside of me. So I'm going to close in saying this. And this, and this is where God really started to open it up to me. He says, In my temple, I had an altar. Yes. In my tabernacle, I had an altar. Yes. In the book of Revelations, if you go to the book of Revelations, and you look up the word altar, there is an altar in the book of Revelations. If you want to really define where it is literally, the altar is literally in heaven. So I have an altar in heaven. So if I have an altar in heaven, I have an altar in the tabernacle, I have an altar in the temple, and then surely I have an altar in the church. So if I have an altar in the church, where is the altar located? Better yet, another question. Is the building the church or are the people the church? If the building is not the church and the people are the church, and if the people are the church and there's an altar in the church, then where's the altar? The altar is on the inside. And God says, you have access to me so long as you believe. When you pray, I'm connected to you. And you don't have to follow what other people do because I have upgraded the system in such a way that the devil cannot handle it. You see, if the altar was in the building, all you got to do is blow up the building and the altar doesn't stand anymore. But when the altar is in the people, even if you kill one, the altar is in another. Even if you kill another, the altar is in another. Even if you kill a thousand, the altar is in the other people that are over there. Even if you take out a country, the altar is in another continent. You cannot stop the altar of God proliferating and connecting to God and even connecting other people outside of the kingdom to God because you have an altar on the inside of you and the altar is Jesus. He's a high priest. He's the altar. He's the living sacrifice. He's everything that we need. And because of that, there's no weapon that's formed against you that can prosper. And I just bring that word because when people are trying to build physical altars, they're trying to do the same thing that they were doing in Israel when they created another temple in Bethel and Gilgal. They were trying to pull people away from the true altar to a false altar. If the altar of God is on the inside of you and someone's trying to pull you to create something outside of you, they're trying to pull you away from the true altar. And one of the problems that we have is that so long as we don't understand this, we will always be looking outside. But when you begin to understand that God is working on the inside of me, then you recognize that instead of me being so frustrated, I need to begin to rethink things because what I have is better than those that pray three times a day outside of Christianity. What I have is better than those that go to 10,000 doors. What I have is better than those who have all kinds of money, for those who have all kinds of fame. What I have is better because what I have can never be taken away from me. It doesn't matter how slick the devil is. It doesn't matter how, how well he operates. He cannot take away the gift of God that's on the inside of me. And the gift of God that's on the inside of me is I can connect with God anytime, anywhere, anyhow because I am his child. So if you're part of the church, then you have access to the altar of heaven and you have the access to God. And if you have access to the altar of heaven and access to God, there is nothing outside of you that you require. You don't need a priest. You don't need a prophet. You don't need an apostle. You don't need anything outside of you. All you need is the Holy Spirit and you need God. And you need to understand that God has made a shift and the altar has evolved from being a location to being within me. We're a living sacrifice. And you can't have sacrifice without an altar. I would admonish every Christian wanting to draw closer to God through worship to read and practice the principles of this book. Whether you are a passionate worshiper, a new believer, a pastor, or someone simply seeking to grow in your personal relationship with God. This book is packed with a philosophy that can shoot your life to the next level. 
It will help you to have an encounter of the revelation and transformation received at the spiritual altar of focused worship. Five Benefits of Worship is now available on Amazon. If you'd like to get your copy, please press the link below. If you'd like more information about Five Benefits of Worship, please visit our website at nevillesolomon.com. Thank you.